Tia Claire Tooby just recently came out with a video explaining that she wants to combine High Rocks fitness racing with CrossFit. That's super interesting because I've talked about this before. High Rocks and CrossFit, certainly at the highest level, are completely different sports. So how can you combine them as an elite athlete? Look, I am the first to admit that it's never a good idea to bet against a phenomenal athlete like Tia Claire Toomey, the most dominant functional athlete of our era. Toomey for the win. Oh. And it's two for Toomey. 100 points and two straight up wins for the defending CrossFit Games champion. But still, in this video, I will lay out two key physiological differences between high rocks and CrossFit. I will explain using real scientific data what sets them apart and why combining both sports racing at the World Championships in Chicago and trying to win the CrossFit Games is gonna be a real challenge even for an athlete like Tia Claire Toomey. I think this video will be packed with super valuable information, so without further ado, let's go straight into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied and taught different aspects of exercise physiology and now want to bring some of that science back to you guys. So the thing that everyone was kind of expecting already uh, came, came true at the end. Uh, Tia Claire Toomey just announced that she will be competing at the highest level in Hyrox, Hyrox Fitness Racing. And what kind of surprised at least me is that she also wants to combine this with qualifying and competing at the CrossFit Games. So I think she and certainly her team understands that this will be a real challenge. And I thought that she explained this very well in her own words in her latest video. So let's look at the 40 second clip of that video. I would say there is somewhat of a risk and setback doing high rocks and really honing in on my running because in CrossFit you need a lot of strength and you need to be able to move weight fast, you need to be strong. In high rocks you do need to be strong but you don't need to be really strong like a CrossFit athlete and I think there is definitely limitations by doing both because I'm trying to really work on my speed in my running for high rocks. I haven't really focused on my lifting at all and when I'm focusing on my lifting that's something that can really slow my running down and I realized that and noticed that a lot when I was actually coming back from my pregnancy with Willow. I hadn't been doing a lot of strength but my running was really fast and then as soon as I started really doubling down on my strength my running slowed down. So there's definitely risk and setback but it's all welcomed and something that I'm prepared to endure and go through because I'm really wanting to challenge myself in the high rocks world. So what she refers to here is a key difference in high rocks and CrossFit. It's going to be the nature of the movement. CrossFit is very power dominant. I will explain in a second what does that exactly mean. While high rocks, and specifically for her, the running, because that's going to be the key focus of her training, I guess. I mean, she's not going to be, have any problems with the functional movements in high rocks. It's more cyclical. It's much more continuous, right? And we really start to understand now why you can consider CrossFit really as a power sport and why the movements are so powerful. Because since, since recently we have access to uh, the World Motions uh, movement sensor. And what does it do? I talked about this in previous videos already. So if you want to learn more, just click the video that is uh, popping up on top of your screen right now. But basically this sensor can assess automatically functional movements and also the instantaneous and average power production of those movements, right? Of those functional movements. So I'm not talking about running, not talking about cycling or rowing. I'm really talking about burpees, thrusters, pull-ups, wall balls, and so on. And let's look at some, some real data. For example, here, I did the workout Cindy, which we all know is going to be pull-ups, push-ups, and air squats. And just look at the blue bars in this chart. This is the instantaneous power. So the power that is instantaneously produced while just doing one body weight air squat. So no external load and so on. And you see how high these power productions are, right? Like we're talk talking about instantaneous power of above 2000. And then you obviously have 
instantaneous powers, like in the split second of 2000, and then it drops to zero, and then again uh, drops to zero, then again drops to zero. And if you would then calculate the average power production during my 15 reps of air squats, we're looking at pretty high watts, I think, around 450 to 500. Obviously much lower than the instantaneous power production, but this shows that just doing 15 bodyweight air squats is actually uh, yielding a lot of instantaneous power. So this is just air squats. I mean, that's obviously a very light, easy bodyweight movement, one of the, I think, the easiest in CrossFit. But what about if you do something heavy? Like, for instance, a hang power clean, obviously a very powerful movement. And what you see here is the power curve over time of one a hang power clean in purple or one stroke on the rower. And you immediately see that the instantaneous power production is much higher during a hang power clean. The power of the rower is much more distributed over time, in this case, two and a half seconds. So obviously, if you have to do a set amount of power cleans in a workout, whatever, 40 power cleans in a workout, the instantaneous power will fluctuate much more compared to when you are uh, rowing. One caveat, this is high power output rowing, right? This is for a one minute max effort row. If you would, for example, do a 20 minute max effort row, then even this power distribution would be flattened out even more and the peak would be lower for sure as well. So I think it's safe to say that the power you have to produce during a Metcon, during a CrossFit workout, is going to be very high, certainly when you look at it from an instantaneous uh, point of view. And then the question arises, okay, where is this power coming from? Where is this energy coming from, the conversion of energy? Where is this coming from? And then a large or an important energy system for a CrossFit athlete is going to be the creatine phosphate system. As you might know from your uh, CrossFit Level 1 handbook or just your biology classes uh, from fifth grade, the most powerful energy system is going to be the breakdown of creatine phosphate towards uh, creatine. And with that free energy, ATP is resynthesized. And ATP is the energy currency of the body, and that is what is used for muscle contractions, for me mechanical contractions. And you see here one of the, the many graphs that uh, are floating around in uh, research papers is that when you do heavy contractions, so instantaneous power very high, for example, uh, four back squats or uh, two heavy deadlifts and so on, there is a, a vast decrease in creatine phosphate stores, obviously because they are used in the muscle to uh, generate that mechanical uh, energy, right? And then it takes some time to resynthesize, to recover this creatine phosphate system. And this resynthesis is highly dependent on oxygen. That's important for uh, later information that I will give you, right? So that is obviously what is happening constantly during a CrossFit workout, like for example, a Metcon where you do power cleans, where you do handstand push-ups, where you do whatever uh, uh, pull-ups, right? There's a constant breakdown of uh, creatine phosphate and then you tr the body tries to recover using oxygen and then you break it down again and then you break it down again and usually when you feel somewhat recovered to go for the next set that is when the creatine phosphate uh, systems are let's say marginally recovered probably not 100 but whatever 70 percent or 80 percent and this uh, cycles throughout the workout and while again we're looking specifically at running for high rocks this is not going to be the case like there's not going to be a strong decrease in creatine phosphate systems throughout the workout certainly not throughout the running portion but it's just going to fluctuate uh, at, at even levels why because most of the energy that is produced that is converted is coming from aerobic energy sources it's much less of an anaerobic sport certainly the running portion compared to CrossFit. And I think this is very beautifully visualized by another wearable that we can use to assess muscle oxygen in the muscle, so live when you are working out. Here I have some data from Train Red, which is an oxygen sensor, a muscle oxygen sensor. Using near-infrared spectroscopy, we can assess the actual amount of hemoglobin that has or has not oxygen. I talked about this device in previous videos. Again, if you're interested in this, just check the link that is popping up on top of your screen. So what did we do here? I think super interesting. I did a workout with Jelle Hoste, and Jelle Hoste is an elite CrossFit Games athlete, an elite athlete in the CrossFit space, and we did Macho Man. And Macho Man is a workout where you do an EMOM style, so every minute on the minute, of 
power clean, front squats and shoulder to overhead, so jerks, with a barbell, a heavy loaded barbell. He used 185 pounds and I used 135. And we did 15 rounds of those movements, right? So you work 25 seconds and then you have 35 seconds, 40 seconds to recover. And what you beautifully can see with him is that he always recovers his muscle oxygen towards baseline levels, right? So he always is recovering likely, I mean, it's an indirect measures, but it, it, it's very closely related, is creating phosphate systems. While me, I'm doing well the first, let's say, five rounds. I can recover the first five rounds. I felt pretty, pretty good. But then I start to break down. And you see it here that the last, let's say, five to six rounds, I actually completely break down and I cannot recover my muscle oxygen during the recovery period. And likely also my creatine phosphate systems or uh, stores will be depleted. And obviously I was super exhausted after this 15 minutes while he was just chilling. He could go for another 20 rounds, I think. All right. So that is something that CrossFit athletes, specifically CrossFit athletes doing a lot of Metcons, have developed to the maximum. They are really good in this anaerobic energy production and using the creatine phosphate cell systems, also the glycolytic systems to produce that energy. Right. That is completely different if you look at the training or let's say the adaptations that Tia Claire Toomey will undergo now by doing a lot of running. This is much more, let's say, cyclical, much less dependent on the skeleton phosphate systems. And obviously, the body adapts to what it is provided, to what the stimulus is. And when she is going to do, I will get to that in a second, a lot of running, these systems will just be less adapted towards the stimulus that is provided, uh, for example, uh, in a CrossFit Games situation where the weights are super heavy and the strength is very important. So to combine both high rocks racing as well as crossfit racing at the highest level just from an energy perspective energy system perspective will be very challenging to say the least one caveat what i what i understand from her video is that she will partake in the doubles and the doubles is going to be much more interval style training so this would favor her for sure much better coming from a strength biased power biased background right so let's see what the future entails and if she is considering racing alone then i think it will be super interesting to see what she can do certainly once she wants to combine this with uh, with crossfit and then a second key physiological difference or a key difference uh, i think with crossfit or related to crossfit training and high training is going to be the training volume let me explain this by pulling up a super interesting at least in my opinion, a case study. So case study is something that is done in research where you follow one specific person or athlete, in this case, an athlete for a given amount of time, and you understand what's happening with his or her physiology. They have done this for Lance Armstrong. Uh, they have done this for uh, Paula Radcliffe, for example. And now they have done this for an elite world champion, an Olympic champion, triathlete Christian Blumfeld. And what did they see here? What did they do? They followed him. They tracked him for three years, and they checked his training volume, how much he trained, and his energy expenditure. And the data are really incredible. He was training 28 hours to 30 hours per week on average for three years. So every day of the week, he was training four to five hours with one rest day in between. I mean, I'm not sure if he actually took rest days, right? So that's a high, high volume of training. It's also, they said, probably the, the maximum amount a human body can tolerate. And then he was expending 7,000 to 8,000 kilocalories each day for three years, right, or, or for the time he tracked. So this means that the training volume for endurance athletes is extremely high. We're talking about 30 hours to even 40 hours some weeks per week. So if you would extrapolate this towards other athletes, the athletes we're talking about, for example, high rocks racers, and you, you let's say, look at it from different modalities, certainly when, when we consider Tia Claire Toomey, she has to do a lot of endurance type work. She's going to do a lot of running and simply the amount of running volume that she has to do to be able to compete at the highest level of high rocks is going to take away a certain amount of mixed modality work and certainly strength work. Exactly what she talked about, right, in the, the little snippet of the video. The high rocks racers and certainly the CrossFit athletes are, I think, going to be able to train less total hours than a pure 
triathlete or a cyclist, just because of the fact that their overall intensity is going to be a little bit higher. That is, I think, meat for another video. But overall, the high rocks racers, because they can incorporate a little bit more zone two and lower intensity, they can train more hours than a CrossFit athlete because just doing mixed modality, high power output work is going to fatigue you a lot. Exactly how she explains here. Then if we fast forward to Monday when we did our open workout, I actually was pleasantly surprised with my performance. That strain um, on Monday for the open workout was only a 9.4. But I tell you what, when you compare the two, I honestly think uh, that lat row, the last 50 calories, was way harder than the whole High Rocks um, event itself because my feet were cramping, I mean, my lungs were breathing heavy. So exactly this, right? Tapping into your major anaerobic sources, for example, during a CrossFit workout, is going to fatigue the athlete much more, exactly how she explains. The overall rate of perceived exertion will be higher and the recovery period will be longer. So that's one of the, the major reasons why it's going to be very, very challenging to actually combine heavy lifting and CrossFit training that is necessary for the CrossFit Games with high rocks uh, fitness racing that needs much more low intensity, longer endurance work. And yeah, I don't know how she's going to plan it, but she definitely has to take these two, let's say, key physiological differences into consideration. But hey, Tia, I'm just a guy on the internet. What do I know? I think it's time to prove me wrong. All right, guys, that was it from my part. Drop your thoughts about this in the comment section below. If you want to learn more in detail what the more obvious differences are between High Rocks and CrossFit, just watch the video that is popping up right now. See you in the next one. Yeah.